Well, so far we've dealt with emotions from the basic emotions, we've talked about cultural influences. But there's a topic that interests most people who are offered psychology, and that is psychological disorders. In this session, I'm going to introduce you to disorders that come about as a result of this um, deficits in emotion. It's important we get to know them so that we know how to prevent them. So at the end of the day, you will be able to know what emotional disturbances look like and see how we can deal with challenges of either having too much of an emotion or too little of it, okay? So we'll talk about emotional disturbance, fear and anxiety, sadness and depression, anger and aggression. First, emotional disturbance. Now, when people think about emotional disturbance, they often think that it's related to um, negative emotions, but that's not true. We can have emotional disturbances as a result of um, having too much of a positive emotion, I'll explain, or having none at all of it. So looking at the slide, emotional disturbances can result from excesses of uh, emotion. For example, people may have a fear of speaking in public. You see, I mentioned that if you look at the continuum, apprehension is a milder form of fear, and terror is the extreme. Now, people, some people feel terrified to stand in front of a group, audience, to present themselves. So that's an excess emotion. When you're going to make a presentation, you need just a little bit of anxiety to peck you, to get you ready for the presentation. But once you are there, if it doesn't go down and you keep, it keep escalating, it defeats the purpose for which it was uh, set in motion. Some people also have emotional deficit. They cannot experience certain emotions. Have you heard about psychopath? They can't experience empathy. That's why they can do heinous, they commit senior crime, they can do dangerous things, and they don't feel a thing because they are not able to empathize. Empathy is your ability to feel what another person is feeling. And so if they can't feel it, they don't mind stabbing you, they don't mind doing anything to you. So you see why that is a problem. And then we have people um, who may have difficulty controlling their emotion, okay? Looking at the intensity range, we need to be able to regulate our emotion. If we are not able to do that, it can get out of control. So you may have heard of people who are not able to control their anger and they committed serious offenses, okay? So here are some of the uh, emotional disturbances that we may be um, encountered with ourselves or we may know people who are going through such things. Now, a group of emotion researchers also have come up with another categorization for emotional uh, disruption or disturbances in our emotions. We can look at the, uh, the, the violence, okay? We can look at intensity or regulation or disconnections. So for example, there are some people who, um, they are not able to have, they either have too much of the pleasant emotion or they, they don't have any at all, okay? So for depression, people who experience depression, it's because they can't feel the positive emotions any longer. All they can remember is the negative emotions that they may have gone through. Or if you look at panic disorders, they have too much of anxiety, okay? That takes them to the extreme. And then some people, they have disturbances in the regulation. For example, people who have mania. Mania or manic is a form where they have, if they are happy, it's overly excited. So they can't regulate that. And they are irritable, they are angry, they can't control that either. So you see, that's the problem for us as well. Um, connection. Um, disturbances. We talked about three components of emotion. 
expression, cognition, and their physiology. So some people, they know what they are feeling within their body, but they can't express it, they can't verbalize it. Okay, example is people who may be experiencing schizophrenia. They have intense emotion within the body, but they have a difficulty communicating that. And that is what leads to a lot of agitation um, within this uh, population. Now, what is the use of negative emotions? They are good. In all the mildest form, they are good. Fear is good. Think of a child who is going through, I mean, going near fire. If that sense of fear is not there, the child can bend themselves. So they need that little amount to stop them from endangering themselves. Anger, a little bit of it is necessary. When something goes wrong, anger comes in to tell you there's something going wrong, you need to correct it. Sadness, there's a room for sadness. If you are feeling sad, it tells you there's a loss and you need to be able to restore it if possible or um, think through how you're going to adjust to it. So you see that all these forms of emotion are important, but it is when they get to the extreme, then they become a disruption or they become an emotional um, disturbances. So let's go into details about some of these um, fear, um, emotions. We look at the milder form of, of it and then we see the extreme form. Okay. So for example, we are looking at fear and anxiety. They are related. Okay. Fear is interesting. Fear is about impending danger. Okay. It's, 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 it's in the future tense. You, you, want, you see something, a threat coming and you develop this dread for it, okay? And the, I mentioned that fear serves a purpose. The purpose is to protect you. So when the child, you shelter the child who is going near fire, the child can, can pull back and that saves the child, okay? Anxiety on the other hand, is apprehension about danger or misfortune. And you, you may have a sense that you are not able to resolve it, okay? If you are not able to resolve that fear and it builds up into anxiety, so it takes you off course. So you remember the, the initial apprehension you have for something. If you are not able to resolve it, then it can escalate into fear or into anxiety for that matter. Okay. And then let's talk about sadness. Sadness and depression. Who has never been sad? We all get sad, don't we? It's part of our human experience. But at what point is sadness um, disturbing? I mentioned the sadness is about loss. It helps you, it prepares you, it has an adaptive function, helping you either to resolve something that has gone wrong or something that um, you may not get it back. For example, if somebody is dead, you mourning the person, that's period of sadness. It's acceptable, okay? Because it helps you, it prepares your mind to first accept the loss and then to make um, necessary changes that will be useful for, your, for the life that is ahead of you. But when sadness persists over a period of time, then it can deteriorate into depression. And that's where the danger is. So there's always room for balance. At what point do we resolve the sadness so that it does not lead to a depressed state? Now, there's an interesting, let me take you to this cycle of depression. Depression is often a cycle. First of all, it starts with the stressful or the emotion event. And then people begin to make, um, try to explain the event. And remember the role of cognition? Okay, you wrote an exam, you got uh, what? A D, say, oh, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bad student. I don't even deserve to be in university. So see your cognition, your thinking. You start blaming yourself. 
I mean, some self of, uh, amount of self-blame is okay because if you did not study, that is, you need to take that blame. But to say that I'm a horrible person, I don't deserve to be in school, look at how I've wasted my parents' money. So you start a negative thought pattern. That leads to depression. And that depression also moves you, you don't want to be around people. It pushes you to be by yourself. It just increases your stress level and the cycle goes round and round and round. So depression uh, uh, needs to be broken at some point. And typically, we can use different methods to help people start to reason, start with the thinking, what they think when things go wrong, okay? And that can reverse the cycle, okay? Let me introduce you also to anger and aggression. Who has never been angry before? I get angry all the time. It's part of human experience. To deny anger is to deny your existence. I mean, that's what I think. We all get different varying levels of anger, but, and, 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 it's, and it's good in a way. Again, it tells you there's something going wrong and you prepare to correct that. But sometimes, again, with other, like I said, with the other emotions, sometimes anger leads to aggression. Unregulated anger can lead to aggression. Okay. So if you look at most aggressive behaviors, you trace it back you see that they started with anger, an angry mood, an angry feeling, okay? That escalates into aggression. But it is not true that all anger leads to aggression. And it's also not true that all aggression has a result of anger, but they are linked. If you are angry, it's almost like if you are not able to manage it well, you may end up um, getting into maybe a fist fight or saying something, being verbally aggressive and all of that. I mean, all of those things are not um, helpful in our social life. So how do we then regulate our anger or all other emotions for that matter? We'll talk about that and the emotion regulation in our next session.